Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the echo chamber of St. James Presbyterian Church <laughs> here at 409 West 141st Street in St. Nicholas Avenue, the village of Harlem, and the city of New York, where we are about to start our Bible study. Uh, we are studying the lectionary readings for this upcoming Sunday, October 27th, 2024, the 30th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Just imagine in five more Sundays, we will be at the beginning of Advent, and I'll speak to you more about that as we move forward. But for now, let us be in the Word and to take a breath and resettle ourselves and ask God to be with us as we begin with our Psalm of the day, which I love this as a prayer, and I will say this to us as in our hearing. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. See, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him and Many are the afflictions of the righteous, Ooh. but the Lord rescues them, rescues them from them all. He keeps all their bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil brings death to the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Ooh, I like this song. Mm -hmm. Psalm 34 is a praise and acknowledgement for deliverance from danger. This individual Thanksgiving um, psalm is in, a, is in acrostic form, which we both know, which we all know, that each verse starts with the letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's an individual Thanksgiving, uh, deliverance from trouble to encourage others to remain loyal to God which is why we give our thanksgiving for what God has done and why we test, give testimony to encourage others to remain loyal to God. As a way of giving thanks, the psalmist promises to announce this very rescue to others so that they too may acknowledge God's goodness. The didactic element underlined in this psalm, that is the teaching of this psalm is to praise and announce the rescue to others so that we can acknowledge, so that others too may acknowledge God's goodness. If you remember in some of the other studies that we've had with the Psalms, we say that, um, we hear the psalmist saying, let us all give our deference to God because God will show us through and our enemies and our friends alike from the outside will say, well, who is this God that is bringing these people through? Maybe we should worship him as well. So this is another reason why we announce that rescue to others so that they too can acknowledge God's goodness. This um, psalm also, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste is also a metaphor for experience. Um, oh, experience and see that the Lord is good. I sort of like that a lot. Um, by our experience, let us see that the Lord is good. Now, of course, we're reading this psalm when we are coming near the end of our of Job. So it makes sense that we are seeing that the Lord is finally hearing and bringing one and delivering one from danger and celebrating that as a psalm today. Let me just get rid of that, that slide here and go back to this. Uh, Sorry about that, y'all. So this is this particular psalm, and it has 22 verses, of course. 
because there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So we will study that accordingly. And let me hear what some of you have think about this particular psalm. I remember we had a minister who every time she would preach, a guest minister, she would say, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Do you remember that, Andrea, with Michelle? I do, in fact, remember that. And what a glorious way to start a service, too. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, To start a sermon, um, because it starts off in that sort of adoration, you know, uh, mode, which which we do anyway. But this is a, it's a beautiful song for that. It really, really, really is. Um, yeah, I like that. It may actually be worked into our prayer of adoration this week. Um, I love this in, in doing pastoral counseling. This is one of the most um, comforting things to be able to say about people who have gone through it and who have turned to God. Look to God and be radiant so your faces shall never be ashamed. And because so many of us feel so much shame and remorse and are triggered about our past and some things and some of our traumas. And this is, says, look to God so that your faces shall never be ashamed because the grace of God has already been poured down upon us with our confession. And I love the idea of being able to say, well, this poor soul cried <laughs> and was heard by the Lord. Um, and he heard my every cry and I was saved from trouble. So I love the Lord because he heard my cry, right? Um, and the redeemed of the Lord say so. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. Mm -hmm. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Taste and see that the Lord is good. This is a, a great testimony psalm that encourages us to share with one another all the ways that God has brought us through and God continues to bring us out. It doesn't have to be you stand up in your pew on Sunday morning, but it does mean that we are not to be ashamed of the gospel and not to be ashamed to say, we know I know a God that can bring you out <laughs> and I am here because I'm telling you that because of my experience. So, are there any other thoughts in this particular psalm that you would like to share with us tonight? Well, hearing none, let us move then to Job, since the psalmist, this psalm seems in our lectionary to refer to this. And we have verses 1 through 6 of chapter 42 and the verses 10 through 17. Last week, when we didn't have our Bible study, God sort of told off Job in a way and says, well, you are questioning me, but were you the one who set the creation in motion? Were you the one who stopped the waters from rising over the land and so on and so forth? Were you the one? You do not understand my plans. And so therefore, how can you contend with me? So this is, here we are in the final verses of Job. Um, and we're near the epilogue as well, which is verses 10 through 17. But let us hear this answer. This is Job's um, second answer to God in this 42nd um, chapter. There's another one that precedes this. So hear these words. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known them before. 
and they ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapoch. In all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children mm. for generations. And Job died old and full of days. Oh, I like that. Full of days. Um, this one through six, uh, this, this, this very first beginning part where he answers God, the second answer to God, and the, it, it mixes out, so we're going to go piece by piece with this one. Job says, I know that you can do all things. Um, he's always known that, but he means that now he recognizes that for God, questions of justice are collapsed into the issue of his power. Job can ever confront God's power, a sphere where he will inevitably be a loser. <laughs> I have uttered. Job means that he now realizes that cosmic justice is a marvel beyond human comprehension, like the structure of the universe. Justice is not a principle or value to which God is subject. I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me. That's a powerful statement. Justice is not a principle or value to which God is subject. Hmm, let us think on that one. I had heard in verse five of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Now that he has heard God for himself and his eye sees him, which is a metaphor for his experience of God, he submits and accepts consolation. This, I despise myself. No object is expressed. And the verb is probably not the Hebrew word ma'as, despise, but masas, melt, be discouraged. Repent in dust and ashes. Job has never acknowledged any sin. So he cannot really be repenting. The verb means rather be comforted. Job means that he will now end his period of mourning in dust and ashes and resume his normal life. Thanks be to God for that. They ate bread with him, not just bread, it was a feast. They, they had food with him. Um, this is that word that holds so much meaning for us even today. Listen to the names of his um, children. Um, he named the first daughter Jemima, turtle dove, it probably means turtle dove. The second daughter Kizia um, is cassia or cinnamon. Um, and please note that cinnamon in this time period is often so valuable that it's worth more than gold or silver. And Karen Hepoch, is an antinomy, a black eye cosmetic. <laughs> so the three names invoke the three senses of hearing, the turtle dove's coo, um, taste, cinnamon, and sight. Um, so the, the accentuation of the eye, their sight. And in verse 15, where it says, Job's daughters were given an inheritance along with the his sons, the brothers. Job's daughters being given an inheritance is an unusual practice, as usually the inheritance mostly goes to the first son and then to the subsequent sons. There are several, several instances in 
a few instances in the in the first testament where for example jacob he gives equally to all of his sons because of what happened with jacob and esau and, and the whole stealing of the of the um of the birthright um he is part of his coming to terms with what, how, what he did to his brother esau is to abolish that tradition in his family and to share his inheritance and his wealth with all of his children equally and there is an opportunity in the point of an opportunity in the wilderness with Moses where there are these daughters who are not married their father dies their brothers are gone and their uncles are fighting over whether or not they should be able to accept the inheritance of their fathers of these of these daughters um, father's inheritance that now have no sons to go to and they plead with Moses and Moses hears their case and he allows them to keep the inheritance so these are really important things to sort of think about in terms of how God is really blessing Job and blessing um, his children and his daughters even here in this day. And you notice that it says they were so beautiful, but they had their own inheritance, which means that they weren't dependent upon men for survival. Um, and Job lived a nice 140 years after all of this stuff had gone down. Um, so this is the happy ending. <laughs> the happy ending. And I wrote something else here, but I, I must not have I must not have copied it. I see. Oh yeah, here it is. Verses seven through seventeen. The naive narrative of the folktale world of the prologue resumes as Job is vindicated in verses ten through seventeen. Um, in the eyes of his extended family, but he's also vindicated in the eyes of his friends um, in verses 7 through 10. So Job's vindication here is the part of this epilogue, and it's almost like, it's, like it starts in the beginning with telling how wonderful Job's life is. It almost ends with saying, oh, but his life is great, um, and he ended his life greatly, and it's just, it, it's bookended with this beautiful folk tale-ish in the beginning and happily ever after that we have here after 42 chapters of what happens here in the life and times of Job. You have any thoughts, you all? How, do you know how old Job was when all of this first began, the, the suffering began? Do we know? Let's see. Hold and on. I ask that because um, the, epi the epilogue says, okay, never mind. <laughs> I was just going to say the, the epilogue says that he lived another 120, another 120 years, years or whatever. Right. <laughs> I know. That's why I'm, so I'm, I'm wonder how old looking was. for this now. So I'm going to find that. Cause right. right. <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, went too far back. <laughs> One through five. Do, 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 do. No, it doesn't. Oh. But he had already had seven sons and three daughters. <laughs> yes. 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 Right. I thought he had the daughters and sons after he mm. came. Well, they were all killed in the very beginning. Yeah. His first, his first ten children were killed in the very beginning. Oh. So this is them coming back. I mean, not coming back to life, but he's he's blessed with ten more children. <laughs> Oh. So I mean, I'm going to say it probably made him about 190. He probably was about 50. Mm. Right. <laughs> right, about 50 years old when it, when all this started. Yeah. 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 Wow. Phew, what a what a life. I know, right? Oof. But then, you know, even if even if all this started when he was 50, how yeah. long did all this go on? Right. That's the right. Other thing right. Out. 
How long did all of this really go on? That's yeah. amazing, isn't it? It's, it's, this is really fairy tale. <laughs> 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 yes, the perfect example of fairy tale. You're so right, <laughs> Sister Mary. It's like it's like with the, with the ending. It's like Little the Red ending. Riding Hood. It's like Little Red Riding Hood. You know, and all of those other ones, like the Grimm's fairy tales. They're so gruesome in the middle. <laughs> yes, but they end at where they live happily ever after. Right, <laughs> right, right. Oh, boy. Good one. That's a good analogy. <laughs> That's crazy. Of course, the, 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 those fairy tales never say for another 120 years. <laughs> <laughs> but they live ever, happily ever after. Ever after, whatever ever after means. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what about your thoughts about what I was talking about with this idea of justice? that Job recognizes that for God, questions of justice are collapsed into his issue of his power. I um, mean, because Job is, is, is one of the pieces for verses one through six that I had that didn't show up in this iteration of my document. Um, in verses one through six, it actually says that Job, um, that God never really answers the accusations of Job. And I thought that that was, that was interesting to me. Um, Job said, Job abandons his lawsuit against God, but his charges have not been answered. Instead, he says, you know, you've already chastised me by saying that your power is above and beyond all of these questions that I'm asking you. And now I understand that I can only ever confront your power and that I can't contend with your power and that your cosmic justice, not the justice that, that we think about, your cosmic justice is a marvel behind, beyond human comprehension, like the structure of the universe. Um, justice is not a principle or a value to which God is subject. And it seems that this heavy duty theological concept or precept that justice is not a principle or value to which God is subject, therefore means that matters of justice and injustice are part of the downfall of humankind. Hmm. It is our creation and therefore wow. our sin. That is a deep, deep theological yeah. precept <laughs> to throw into this at the very end of this book. So when we ask those questions, I guess, those questions, those big questions is, why does God allow so much of this evil to happen in the world? That this is not a principle or a value to which God is subject. Therefore, justice and injustice are human principles that are either upheld or despised. My, 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 as they used to say in the back. <laughs> they still do. Okay, so I'm going to push back and say, then how do you reconcile that God is a just God? That that is what, because that is what we want. Because that is a that is a concept that we that we affix to God. Um, the, the, in the, in terms of this particular text, I'm not saying that in terms of the, the larger theological principle principle of that that because okay. that's such a great part of the debate. But here in this text, it was saying that God is a that that being a just God, that God having all power. Um, that that justice and that that justice, something that we want God to be or something that we want to affix to God. And very often in this particular instance, I would say that if we need to declare that God is a just God, then we also want to hold out and say, why then, God, are you unjust at times? 
that it's a human way of trying to sort of equivocate um, and in lack of understanding what God is doing and how God is acting. It's very, but it's only here in the book of Job that I'm, I'm throwing up this theological principle because it, it doesn't play out in some other places, right? No, right. And I mean, you know, it goes back to kind of what we were discussing over by us, you know, how do, how do you make it make sense? And also, Reverend Pond, if we say that God is a just God, then it is humanity that ruins God's justice, right? We're the ones that mess it up. <laughs> would be a, That's would be, true. Would be another answer. <laughs> like, like if, if justice is a part of the, if being just is a part of God's almighty creative power of creation and cosmic reality, right? And cosmic justice is a marvel beyond our human comprehension. Then we're the ones that deconstruct it and therefore create injustice. Oh, Lord. We are convicted as a, as a, as a species. Okay. And, and yeah, there would be truth to that because that would be therefore part of our sinful nature, which then, right. you know, goes back to when, you know, Job didn't get an answer from. God and Job dismissed his three homeboy, and then Eliehu spoke up, and then he was just silent. And God came up and said, "Well, you know, did you hang the heavens? Did the did the star mm -hmm. cry holy, holy for you? You know, did you measure the depths and breadths of of you know the oceans or you know whatever you know whatever the list the list was, knowing that Job." couldn't answer and then he gets to, to the end of that and he says you know i've asked once i won't ask twice you know i'm <laughs> gonna be quiet because evidently I, I don't i don't know there it is and also what you just said reverend pond is that it, that the, the whole term is at a at a higher level than 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 we think when we use the word justice right um and and that that it's a it's a hmm a universal term rather than a local term. Um, uh, and I, I, I really think God, God is thinking or is doing justice as God's definition of justice is, not ours. Hmm. I agree with that. Because God's ways are not our ways and God's mm -hmm. thoughts are not our thoughts. Mm -hmm. So how we define it is not going to be the same way, nor understanding in the way that God defines it or executes it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because in both instances, God's justice is not to kill you. Remember, he told he told the adversary from the beginning, you can do anything you want from him, but you can't have his life. Which probably tore the adversary up, the fact that he couldn't have his life, because he comes to what? Kill and, dis and to destroy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As I said before, my, 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 my. <laughs> um, Something else I realized too. Yes, well, sir. God. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. Yes. When God restored um, Job's fortune, God works through his friends and family to like uh, to bring him a piece of coins, each of them. Yeah. So there, um, it kind of makes me realize the how God's work, he bless us through our brothers and sisters, our community. Yes. So that like brings us like to, to think deeper, how should we work together especially when we have a friend that went to a trouble and then how as being part of his life and his community should we come together to restore that person you better go ahead and preach i'm telling you <laughs> <laughs> speak that truth orlando <laughs> yeah that's beautiful that is beautiful. Let me, I want to read a verse. Where is this verse? It seems to have disappeared. 
<laughs> I am looking at the book of Exodus, chapter 22, and I'm looking for verse 4. And as Reverend Pond and I were talking a couple of weeks ago in a private conversation, it seems to go from 3 to 5. Look at me. Oh, Joe. Well, <laughs> the reason why I say that is because Job's fortunes are doubled, correct? You see this in this verse here that the Lord, right. in verse 10, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Well, right. in our text, it, and in the, the commentary, site reference, um, Perhaps it, that Job's lost possessions are restored to him twice over. Perhaps an acknowledgement that what he had lost at the beginning of the story had actually been stolen from him by God. Site reference Exodus 22.4, where a thief must pay double restitution. Ooh, no wonder that's sticked out of the Bible, huh? <laughs> I'm going to have to go back into my um, Tanakh and Jewish scriptures to take a look at that one. Yes, because that doesn't coincide with what Job said at the beginning when he first lost everything before his health. He said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But that's also... Um, he didn't say the Lord stealeth. Well, that's, that's also the whole kind of concept of this whole notion that what happens and what is acknowledged in the heavenly plane and what is acknowledged on the earth are totally separate in the story of Job. Like Job has no idea what they're talking about here. And God is saying, well, I'm gonna let you take this from him. Um, and he takes everything from him, but it is not Satan that does it. It is really God letting it happen. So therefore, ostensibly God takes it away. Um, but I think what, what they're trying to say here in the comment in the comment section of this particular text in this Bible is that um, that there is a notion to weave in here that this double is a consistent thing with God and for God's people according from the time of Moses all the way through. So it may be woven in here for that particular reason. It's very interesting, as you say. Oof. That whole thing just sort of plays with my mind, you all, a little bit still, thinking that there are like these two realities that are going on. That, and, the, and the one reality has no clue of what's going on in the other reality. And yet they are the ones being affected by it and living it. Um, it's very dramatic. And I don't mean dramatic and like, oh, I mean dramatic in terms of like, um, a very dram filled with dramatic tension in order to create the sphere of what it is that we're talking about. Yeah, because Job does not know what's going on up in the heavenly realm. I know, that, that's where that Marvin Gaye come song comes in. What's going on? Don't have a huh? Right, what's going on? And that, <laughs> in some ways, God is boasting about him in, a, in, a, in, a, in some sense. We say, well, have you tried my... Mm -hmm. yep. my, you know my servant Joe yeah. and then when he comes back the second time he said you know you try to make me kill that boy for no reason <laughs> you want to try him again so it's kind of like a little bit of a boasting going on too you know mm -hmm. oh yeah most definitely most definitely most definitely and I want us to take comfort in the idea that you know so often we're always, we love to say the fact that, oh, well, we'll, you know, no one can ever see God. Well, I like the way that in Job it says, you know, I had heard, but now my eyes see you. And that seeing is a metaphor for experiencing God. So if you ever experienced God before in your life, then you can say, I have seen the Lord. <laughs> and this is your ability to say so. Job 42.5, so go ahead and go for it. And this, I love that they've sort of broken apart the, the linguistic notion of the word despise. 
um, probably not the Hebrew ma'as, but the, but the Hebrew masas. Um, therefore, um, I am melted and I am discouraged, um, but I can now take off this mantle of mourning. Because if you remember, he, he puts on dust and ashes, which is a symbol of mourning everything that he has lost. And this beautiful notion of um, repent, or not even so much repent, but to, I am comforted now that I'm able to remove myself from these dust and ashes. Can you imagine the bath that that man must have had? Mm. Yes, because he was hanging out in the garbage heap, y'all. <laughs> Outside of the community. If I was his wife, I'd be like, wait a minute, baby, let me hold you down first. Let me just hold you down. Then you can you can come in and get the soap then. Mm. And the other, thing, the other thing I like about this is that it gives us humans in this time period an opportunity to metaphorically do things for ourselves that will have us be in remembrance of all that God has done. We can, ex we can experience God and know that we have seen God's handiwork. When we feel as if we are heavily laden with dust and ashes because of our mourning and because of our brokenness, fill up the tub and get in the bath and pray and say, I am comforting myself by washing off the dust and the ashes and the pain. And it's such a beautiful metaphorical, spiritualistic, ritualistic things that we can do and that we can say that Job affords us with if we look at it in that aspect. Mm -hmm. What I did not understand, things too wonderful for me. Um, to think about the creation as being too wonderful for us. Ooh, what a joy and a gift that is experientially and existentially in our lives that when something is so wonderful, we say, I don't understand it, but it's too wonderful for me. Thank you, God, for being too wonderful for me. Ooh. Mm. Yes, Lord. Imagine if we said that. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. I think there'd be some angels dancing in heaven if we really did that all the time, right? <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that. And um, just once again, to, to hearken back to the daughters, Jemima, Kezia, and Karen Habok, they're named women in the Bible, and they're named <laughs> women specifically for the, um, as I mentioned before, the three senses of hearing, taste, and sight, and how precious the turtle dove, how precious cinnamon, and how precious to outline the eye and to focus on vision and sight. Last week, um, in my sermon on Sunday, when I was looking at images after I was looking at, looking at the text um, that I wasn't able to do the video for, it, it says, Job, so God came to Job in a whirlwind. And some of the imagery, the images that have been generated from that um, really are of the sphere of clouds with this piercing eye looking through. It's like this mystical notion of that, that the eye and seeing is very important for ancient people, which is when you see the eyeliner on the Egyptian goddesses and on the Egyptian gods and, and, and um, the, the eyeliner that was worn that you see on, on the statues um, and on the carvings, that that sense is not just for cosmetic um, appeal, but it is to highlight the sense of sight and being able to see and being able to see deeply. So here we have mm. the sound of the turtle dove, the coo of the, tur the turtle dove, the expensive, expensive spice of cinnamon, worth more than gold or silver in trading. Mm. I mean, think about that. We always hear silver and gold, silver and gold, but cinnamon was more, was meant, was much more valuable. 
So you have this hearing, this sight, and then this, these, this value, these three women and what they possess and what their names say that they possess, the beauty of being able to hear the sound of God, the value, the, the true value of something that is so precious and the, the ability to see clearly and to highlight that sight. It's very, I think it's very mythologically important that these three women are named and that the meanings of their names sort of are lifted up. And the fact that because of these qualities that they possess, they also get the extra blessing of being given an equal inheritance. That's powerful. And, and being given those names at the beginning. Yeah. So they were named those things, those names, and then they were given the inheritance. So it's it's all in that. And with, without Job's, uh, without the end of this chapter, <laughs> Job named those three daughters. Right. Right. With the, with the connection as you're explaining it. I just think it's beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. And it is that wonderful notion um, that I love to do. I love doing the etymology of people's names, and like where do names come from and what do they mean? And sometimes I love to, I think I've told you all this before, I worked with some juveniles in a juvenile boot camp and I did six months of aftercare with them and every, for seven years and every year I would do an exercise where I would come in with the definition of their names and have them look up their names and, you know, they would be so fascinated by it. But then I would say to them, okay, now, now that you see this, what would it mean from having your past have, have been a juvenile delinquent, quote unquote, if you lived into your name? And to watch them sit up around the table, literally sit up around the table and sit back and think about what that could possibly mean. Like John meaning king. You know, that, that whole idea of living into our names, it's a great exercise. And very often, um, Andrea, as you're mentioning, that was the practice. You waited until the child was born, and then you would see what qualities they, they put forth in the first week, month or so of their birth, of their living, and you would name them accordingly so that they would live into that. We hear that, what's the, what's the name of that? Um, the, when we think about prosperity gospel, the guy, what's that, that scripture that people use? Uh, there's a gospel song. Uh, what's his name? His mother named him Misery, <laughs> um, in a way. Jabez? Yes, 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 yes. And that the counter to that was God blessing him to counter the curse of his name so that he wouldn't have to live into his name because of his mm -hmm. mother's disappointment with her life. So the, the names are so important. Um, so I'm glad that we were able to sort of bring that out and looking at the names of these three women in the Bible, which the Presbyterian women of St. James, if I wasn't doing it before, I sure enough do it now. <laughs> So thank you for that. Any other thoughts on this particular pericope that we're studying for Sunday? Hearing none, that seems to be all have voted aye. It's time to move on. And we will go to our last reading in Hebrews. Um, there wasn't much commentary for this, but I'll go ahead and read this and give a little bit of an explanation um, from my perspective here. Hebrews 7, chapter 7, verses 23 through 28. Furthermore, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, Christ, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. 
Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. In order to understand this and where we're coming from, I'm going to go back to where we, because it does pick up from a little bit of the understanding of how the writer of Hebrews is speaking about Jesus as the high priest. More so than the high priest of the temple, he says he's like a priest, like a person who is of the priesthood of Melchizedek. Melchizedek's priesthood is different from the Levitical priesthood. The Levitical priesthood, we know that God told Aaron, you and your family will be the priests of my people. Um, and so all of Moses is, all of Aaron's children, therefore, um, the, from the tribe of Levi are the priests, even up until the time that we read in Jesus. So this is, but Melchizedek's priesthood is different. The Dead Sea Scrolls give evidence of a Jewish speculation on Melchizedek as an angelic heavenly figure who rescues the righteous. That's some text I haven't read, 11Q Melchior or whatever. And from Genesis 14, 17 through 20, the author deduces that the mysterious priest King Melchizedek was greater than Abraham or his descendant Levi. There is no mention in the Bible of Melchizedek's ancestors, birth and death. The one who lives, quote unquote, as his death was not recorded. Jesus, in the order of Melchizedek, means as, as in like him. So this is a comparison between the Levitical priests because there were so many, but they kept dying. So you had to have new ones to, to bring up the, and whenever a priest goes in, um, if you remember one of the major things that the priest was to do at all of the high holy days is to go into the Holy of Holies. Aaron, Aaron lost his two sons this way because they were impure when they went into the Holy of Holies um, and would first have to confess and bring their personal sins to God before they could bring the sins of the people to God. So they would cleanse themselves and then ask for cleansing for the people and make the sacrifices for themselves and sacrifices for the people. They're saying Jesus doesn't have to do this. Jesus does not have to worry about somebody taking over his office who may be unworthy because he holds it permanently and he is there forever. You can also understand how this language around priesthood would speak to Gentiles. Gentiles who formerly are worshiping foreign gods, who are very often going to oracles and very often going to priests and priestesses for, for all of their understanding of how to be in relationship with God. And the book of Hebrews, in a sense, in terms of the Hebrew history, logically explains how Jesus usurps all of the other ideas of what priesthood is and that priesthoods are, are consequently um, inept because of Christ's permanent and everlasting high priesthood. 
blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Um, and that the sacrifices that he, made, he makes, that he made for us, he didn't have to do it for his own sins first. He just did it for us. He didn't even have to do it, but he did it for us. So, I love it. I love it. What's a great I, Go ahead. Do Catholics, do Catholics read this book? Um, I believe the priests do. <laughs> I don't know how they respond to that. Um, I think they still believe that they are acting on behalf of bringing this to the high priest of Christ. Um, but perhaps in a beautiful way in Reformation, we hold to this very dearly. Um, the priesthood of all believers, we say, because Christ is the ultimate priest and we go directly to Christ because he's already brought all of this and there is no need for sacrifices um, on our, for us to make sacrifices for one another and I certainly can't do it for you, but Jesus has already made the sacrifice and that the intercession um, is, I love that, since he always lives to make intercession for us. Mm. So I'm not sure um, of the Catholic rationalization um, according to this scripture. It's something I have to look into and study a bit further ecumenically. Other thoughts? And there's so much literature in, in Leviticus and so on and so forth in Hebrew history about the priesthood. And we also know that it was the priests who sort of like in their own humanity and in their own sinning were the ones who sort of acquiesced to Rome um, in so many different ways and were really, really fearful of retaliation from Rome. Um, yeah. Scapegoated so many because of that um, and went in with the taxation and so on and so forth that there has to be an understanding about this bringing up of Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews, that there is something even purer that, um, that God put in place to be the model for priesthood was this Melchizedek, this angelic heavenly mm -hmm. figure who rescues the righteous. And the righteous are those who come to God and say, please hear my cry, forgive my sin, and accept my sacrifice. This mysterious no, Jesus, no birth, no death. Um, and with right. the recorded right. No no birth, no death. He shows up on the scene and it's like, well, is he human or is he angelic? Is he fictitional or is he is he divine or is he is he both divine and Human, I, I will admit that Melchizedek thing always made me have a lot of questions because I've read mm -hmm. all of them. I okay. read being that, being that Melchizedek that, comes, being that Melchizedek is 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 a, a Genesis kind of thing. Um, it fits with the encounter of all of those many of those first persons in the text that encounter God first through God's representatives. And that's like with Jacob wrestling with the, the, the angel, right? He wrestled with the angel and said, I will not let you go until you bless me. But the angel sort of morphs later on in the language of the book into an encounter with God. So there's a, a lot of conflation between how God presents God's self and God's experience to humanity um, in the very beginning of our text that they're sort of holding on to saying that, well, Melchizedek, Melchizedek did this 
thousands of years ago, but we have the real one now in Christ, that, that, that even that angelic figure, if it were an angel or an angelic figure, still couldn't do an influence for the people, what a priest and priesthood was really all about. So God said, well, my son, who has no sin, who does all of this, my son will be the one that will do this for all time. There's no longer any need. But also remember that Hebrews is answering, trying to figure out an answer for the people, not only the Gentiles, but for the people who are mourning the destruction of the temple and the destruction of their entire holy system. These Jews that have now become Christian are like, but what do we do? This is all gone now. And Hebrews says, Jesus is taking care of that. You don't have to worry about that anymore. When he said literally, and this is just a, 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 me throwing this on top of Hebrews, when he said literally that I will rebuild the temple in three days, meaning that I will staff it, I will build it, and I will be the priest of it. Sort of a natural lineage from, from that concept that Christ spoke about to be named and formed in this structure of understanding in the book of Hebrews. God, y'all making my head hurt from thinking so hard. I love it. <laughs> the revelations that come forward. So our takeaway from this is that Jesus is our priest interceding for us for all time. So therefore, our confessions and our blessings are all done between the Creator, Christ, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Yes. Yes. Oof. Thanks be to God. Yes. Amen. Thanks be to God. Mm. So I just had a moment there, thinking about how powerful that is. If there's nothing further, then we can go to our gospel lesson. Our gospel lesson is in Mark 10. This is uh, Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. Um, this rest restoration of sight to Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. Um, well, bar, it should be bar slash Timaeus, son of Timaeus, or Timaeus Ben, or whatever you want to say. But there are different things that, like Judah Ben Hur is the son of Judah, um, Judah Hur, or something like that. That's how that all works out. But the passage for our understanding is this literary transition to the gospel central section of Jesus entry into Jerusalem. So this is the middle time right before we get Jesus going into Jerusalem. So they came to where? To Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. So let us get to some of this beautiful commentary. 
Uh, Jericho, a town in the Jordan Valley, east north northwest of Jerusalem, and about a day's journey away from Jerusalem. The name Timaeus probably reminded Mark's audience of Plato's familiar work by that name. Bartimaeus' blindness may imply a critique of philosophical reasoning as the means to clear insight. There's a lot of that woven into um, a lot of that critique and the understanding of that many people around people in Jesus' time were really beholden to these Greek philosophers. Um, let me see. Son of David, 47. Rarely used in Mark, the title links Jesus on his way to Jerusalem to Jewish hopes for the renewal of the Davidic kingdom. Mark probably downplays the title significance for Jesus because of its military implications. Your faith has made you well. It wants us to go back to 2, 5. To the note for 2, 5. Their faith to trust implicitly Jesus' access to God's sovereign power and thus inspire Jesus to pronounce this man's spiritual as well as physical restoration. Your faith has made you well as more than just the physical restoration, it is also spiritual. The way used by early Christians to denote discipleship. So immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Not on the way to Jerusalem, but on the way. He became a follower of the way. Mm -hmm. That's how the early church was known as the, the people of the way um, before it became the church after the first century concluded. They were followers of the way um, and they were followers of Christ, but mostly followers of the way. Um, and church came later. So that's why you very often hear me when I'm talking about the Gospels, I make a distinction between Christ followers. And when I'm talking in the epistles at a certain period of time, you'll hear me say small house churches. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. And that notion, again, when you always hear me talk about empire, 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 this son of David had mercy on me, the way that it was explained in this commentary, that's where that comes from with me, is that son of David, the Messiah, so on and so forth, they are expecting Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and he is going to restore the Davidic kingdom, which means that it is a military connotation and a military coup and takeover that Jesus, that they're hoping that Jesus will do. Mark plays it down, just says, well, call him over here. Get him over here. And it's not because you called me teacher and it's not because you called me son of David. Your faith has made you well. You see me, you experience me to use the the language from C again, from, from our, our, our Job, you experience me in a way that you experience my access to God. Oh, isn't that beautiful? You experience my access to God and it has made you well. And he regained his sight and followed him on the way. That's it for the commentary for these six verses. What are your thoughts about this? I love that notion of faith as access to God. Mm. Ooh, let me write this, write that down. Wait a minute.
because it puts the whole notion of faith at another realm. Right, does it though? Mm. I'm a QWERTY typer in my, on this keyboard that I have, the, <laughs> the, um, the capitalization on the left hand doesn't work, so it drives me crazy. <laughs> But that idea of faith as access to God, Andrea, it layers into the work and the thought process that I've been doing for years with us and trying to really hone in on this notion of faith being more than just hoping that God will, but that faith is that God can, does, and will. And that faith is recognition that we have access to that. Yes. Yes. Ooh, Jesus. Yes. Mm. My, 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 my. Amen. It was, I was, um, that question of why the man said, Jesus, son of David. Son of David. Thank you, too. Yes, the Son of David title, which we rarely hear in the book of Mark, we hear Son of God and Son of Man and all of that other stuff. Son of David, well, Son of Man and Son of God, those are also titles that are in contention with Caesar because Caesar uses those terms. Son of God is a man, is a human being that is designated by God to do God's work. Caesar takes on that title as well. Son of Man is, 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 a, a, is also um, a version of that, but it's sort of juxtaposed as, as God, having, God having chosen you from the outset um, as a human being to do this work. So there's a, a slight distinction, but this Son of David is really thinking about like I said, the, res the restoration of David's kingdom. Like, we, I believe that you are of, the, the, of David's line, and since we haven't had a king in over a thousand years, I believe that you are ready and that you are the son of David and that you are my one and only king. So have mercy on me. Son of David, now that we are putting this in this context, is something that would be heard by the opponents of Jesus when they say, he says that he's the king of the Jews because they're calling him son of David from the Davidic line that is promised to be and to overthrow all because it is God's promise to David. So he is calling him out to say, son of David, I believe that you are this king that comes from the line of David that is about to do this miraculous thing of turning over and getting our, getting our kingdom back. Have mercy on me. Remember me. Have mercy on me. And many people would, I love the way that, and the, I'm so glad you asked that question because I love the way that Mark holds all of this in, 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 in a bowl per se. So that there's, there's all mixed in with this whole messianic notion of doing what God's work is to be done. There is the Davidic promise of you are of the line of David, so you will be the king of the Jews. And all of these people that are around Jesus that are all hoping that that's what he's going to do. Jesus doesn't say, he says, call him here and says, well, what do you want me to do for you? He doesn't say, oh, so thank you for knowing that I am the one who is going to be this Davidic king, blah, blah, blah. He's like, you're calling me all these great things, but what do you really want me to do for you? So that his plea becomes very personal. His, his conversation with Christ becomes about his desire to see Again, in all the connotations that see means spiritually, let me see again. 
And Jesus hones it in and says, it's not about that. It's not about me being a king. It's not about me overturning Rome. What do you need God to do for you? Let me see again. So this son of David, um, just to go back to your question, is a title that many people are looking for this king, the son of David of the Davidic line to come and rule Israel once again as a nation. Militarily. What'd you say? Militarily. Right. Because there hasn't been a king of Israel for a very, 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 very long time. But it's promised, it, it was promised by God to David that your, your, your sons and your family shall always be my chosen. Which is why it's important for Mary and Joseph to be together because Joseph is of the lineage of David. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, on another subject, uh, this is Reverend Lacey. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm disturbed that here's another instance of the disciples and others close to Jesus discouraging yes. uh, someone from coming to Jesus. There, there aren't there a number of these instances throughout Jesus' ministry. I think last week it was the children. Yeah, a couple of weeks. Um, children. But they're, they're, the disciples are so often, it seems, discouraging uh, people, uh, dis discover discouraging Jesus from reaching out to certain people, and dis discouraging people from reaching Jesus. I, I think we ought to that is so, look at that is so powerful because I, I, I also think, you know, the disciples are Jewish as well, right? So they're following along with Jesus. I want to be at your right side and at your left side is what they said last week. Those are positions of power. Yeah. Positions of power. So it's almost as if the 12, by the time we get here, are fully into the mindset of like, well, yeah, we are following this holy man who is the son of God. We believe he's the Messiah. But that also means that we are the general cabinet. <laughs> we are the, we, once he becomes the general, then we are the ones who are in charge. So they start acting like this. That's what I see their behavior like, Reverend Lacey. I see them gatekeeping, gatekeeping in a way so that by the time when Jesus finally does all do all of this stuff, they'll have a system in place where the monarchy, where just like very few people could come to David, that will all be in place by the time Jesus comes into power. And Jesus is like, you still don't understand. But could you have been with Jesus for more than a minute and not, and your heart not uh, be open to helping a blind person, a beggar, uh, achieve what, what you know Jesus can do for him? You better go you ahead and ask that question. And you better go ahead and ask that question in 2024. Can you, can you say that right? you follow Jesus and not? want people to have health care? Can you say that you follow Amen. Jesus and Amen. not want people to have enough food on their table? Can you say that you follow right. Jesus and not right. want to see the oppressed and those who are those who are in shackles go free? Can you yes. say you follow Amen. Jesus and don't want affordable housing? Right. Right. Can you spend any time with Jesus and not and I can see that these things are important. <laughs> I want to separate people. 
after we have had World Communion Sunday and the table is wide and we're all supposed to be sitting at the table regardless of station, status, color, creed, economic status, thought, gender, color, or disability, ability. Yeah. Y'all better be careful. Y'all got preachers on the line now. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> Spending time with Jesus. New preachers for sure. Yes. Oof. Oh, were you in the room and still Spending not present? Time. It's present. Right. right. You missed the party. As they say, that'll preach. <laughs> mm -hmm. And these were disciples and in the crowd. And general cabinet. <laughs> PCUSA. And I didn't mean that in a Presbyterian <laughs> term. I'm sorry about that. If I if I led you on to believe that I was thinking about Presbyterianism, I was thinking more no, of the You wasn't, cabinet. but I was. You wasn't, but I was. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm sorry right. about that. I was thinking about the cabinet, the presidential cabinet. <laughs> Secretary. I was thinking about that too. Uh, okay, <laughs> man. All right. I was thinking about the <laughs> yeah, we, are not, we are not so far removed. That will be in my but if that's how you want to take it, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> but, but, but no, but see, no, we can't be so far removed that we point the finger and don't think there is a thumb not pointing back at us. Right, exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. God, right. people. Come on now. Right. Call my mind. Right. Okay? All right. Let me be quiet. Wow. Uh-uh. Uh Mm. Ooh, got some stuff going on here. Very good. Thank you. Thank Excellent. you. Is there anything else that we would like to lift up with our text for this evening? I do want to say thank you, God, that you brought Job out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hey, Job is my man. Been hanging out with him for the last couple of weeks. We were with him for a month, y'all. <laughs> we were with him for, for four weeks. And thanks. Be I have a question about Job. Mm -hmm. um, in the other liturgical years, A and C, do mm -hmm. they talk more about the friends than Job? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can never remember. I think you're right about that. This one, this year seems to really have been about his encounter, his engagement with God and, and mostly about Job and Job. But I don't think we get a lot of Job in the other liturgical lectionary years. I just have to go and look at the entire year and see what that's about. Because they needed a tongue lashing too, you know? Oh, when that happens, um, God actually does that uh, a little bit of that in verses um, 7 through 9 <laughs> and 42 and a couple of verses. He's like, okay, you, I'm vindicating him in front of you all, but you all didn't really trust, so. <laughs> wow. That, that'll be interesting, and it's a great study. It's a long book. Of, I can't wait to see what Amakai is going to do with it when he studies it. Oh, yes. he did, because he did, because he, he's doing it in order. So I think he may have already done Job. I can't remember. But we'll see. Okay. Well, all hearts and minds are in, are of, in order and of good faith. I would ask that you would prepare yourself in a posture of prayer. And let us... Call on God for who and what God is. Almighty God, the powerful, benevolent, loving God that exhibits your love through your power, whose power is so magnificent that in our, under, in our lack of understanding of it, all we can do is be in awe. And that the awe of it Let's us recognize the power we have because we have access 
to you and all that you offer through our high priest Christ and through our faith. We ask, O oh God, that you would hear the, hear the warning in the book of Mark that we not be those who are in the company of Christ and yet still gatekeep from God's blessings for all people. May we be gate openers so that all may come and experience the glory of God, the power of Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit. God, we thank you for letting us sojourn with Job. We've come to realize that in many of our lives, when it seems that all is falling apart, that you are still there and that you are still watching us and that if we can just hold on a little while longer, you will bring us through the storm. That is the hope of Job. We thank you, O oh God, that we can bless the Lord at all times because we know that you do marvelous things on our behalf before we even recognize it. We thank you, O oh God, for letting our experience be our actual sighting of you every day in our lives. We ask, O oh God, that you would allow us to take a bath and remove our dust and ashes from the morning of our sinful selves and remind us of our baptismal moment where we came up out of the water clean and new. May we resonate that with that and ritualize that in our lives often and well. God, we pray tonight that you would be with your people as we go about our ways, but that we never leave your presence and that you would allow us to continue to pray for one another that the revelations of these words and the revelations that have come to your people through these texts will continue to resonate, will continue to expand, but more importantly, continue to deepen themselves in our hearts and expand our love for you. And it is in Christ's name that we pray and say, Amen. 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 Thank you. I feel like I have church tonight, y'all.